Welcome to a conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is David Harvey, who is Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at CUNY Center in New York. He is the author of numerous books, including The Condition of Postmodernity, The Limits of Capitalism, The Urban Experience, and his most recent publication is The New Imperialism. David, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Where were you born and raised? A uh, place called Gillingham, Kent, just outside of London, about 30 miles outside of London. And, and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, I was raised in uh, World War II, and uh, my father was uh, in the dockyard uh, repairing ships, so I got a very close-up view of the kind of military activities that were going on during World War II as a kid, and uh, learned a lot, I think, about um, relations to the world and, 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 you know, the British presence in the world and what that was all about from a very early age. Mm -hmm. And and what? Uh, where were you educated? Uh, in Gillingham, in state Gillingham. school. And then and, and then at the university level? Uh, I went to Cambridge, got a scholarship to Cambridge, and stayed there and did my PhD there. Mm -hmm. uh, and and what what led you to geography? I uh, partly uh, partly what I've already mentioned. Uh, since my father was close to the navy and there's a sort of naval tradition, I was kind of thought somehow or other. Uh, knowing the world and sailing the world kind of thing almost in my mind was, was a very important thing for me at a very early age. So I was always drawn to the idea of knowledge of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and most Americans don't know the dis they don't know geography and they don't know the discipline of geography. What, what, t tell us a little about the problem set that, that geography is, is con concerned with. It's more than maps. Oh yes, a lot more than that. I mean, just to fill in some background, I mean, most of the people who taught me at Cambridge uh, came out of either military background or out of the colonial experience. So geographical knowledge had been very important to those two spheres of action. Uh, after World War II, there was a withdrawal of geography very much into sort of uh, association with planning, regional planning, development, and so on. So it became very much more uh, a local kind of discipline about what was going on in localities and, 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 and the like. But I was raised in a situation where there was very little theoretical apparatus for this. It was a more sort of just ad hoc, empirical kind of discipline. And I think one of the ambitions I gained at a very early age was to try and give some sort of theoretical basis to it, some sort of theoretical center to what seemed to me to be a really fascinating uh, empirical set of issues. Mm -hmm. and, and what was your, your dissertation or your first major study on? Uh, this, this will make you laugh. It was about hop cultivation in Kent in the 19th century. <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of thing, this is where you get prizes for totally irrelevant. But actually I learned a great deal out of it. It was mm -hmm. a wonderful uh, thing about uh, sort of transitions that had occurred in my local area where I was born uh, over about a hundred year period uh, in sort of cultivation techniques and agricultural labor and and uh, financial conditions and so on so it was a very it was a very uh, a very exciting thing to do, and I think I drew a lot from it in terms of what I subsequently did on a much grander scale. In, in, the earlier, in this earlier phase of your work, were you more a traditional, what we would call a social scientist, or, or how would you distinguish uh, uh, that work from what we know as social science? I was a, I, in my terms, I was just a traditional geographer with a bit of a, an interest in sort of what was universal, what was general about this. So even though I was doing something in a very local area at a very specific period of time, I was interested in what kind of general principles were governing mm -hmm. transformations in the landscape, transformations in social relations, uh, transformations in production practices and technologies and financing and all those kinds of things. So I was very interested in those sort of universal principles as they kind of were manifest in a very local area at a particular, at a particular historical time. Mm -hmm. Now, you uh, uh, were at the university probably in, in, in 68, and many of the European intellectuals who I've interviewed 
uh, were very much affected by that year. And, and I'm curious uh, how you were, whether you were still a student or already no, teaching? No, 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 I'd, I'd already been teaching for eight or nine years. Oh, okay, all right, okay. So, no, I finished my PhD in 61. Okay, so, but were you uh, affected by the, the radical movements of the 60s? Well, or, this, or were this, you already this, this radical? Is a, this is a very funny story. No, well, I was, I was always kind of uh, left-leaning, but in the 1960s in Britain, uh, you could be sort of left-leaning, uh, but um, you didn't have to be sort of radical in any way because the Labour Party was there and we, a lot of us had faith in the Labour Party and its transformative capacities. But I was so busy writing a book in 1968 that I never really noticed what was happening. <laughs> I confess this, you know. So, and, and, and I finished the manuscript uh, almost in May 68, mm -hmm. and I was so preoccupied with it that I, I, I put the manuscript on the desk and I went to Australia and I got to Australia and everybody in Australia says, what the hell is happening? <laughs> in Europe, uh, 68, I said, I had no idea, you know, I had been so involved in writing this book. So it didn't affect me that way. I think it f affected me subsequently in terms of reflections on it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, uh, another uh, part of uh, your profile, I guess, in a way, is a, uh, a, a, uh, the influence of Marxist theory mm -hmm. on your work. And, and I'm, I, I want to talk about that dynamic between ge geography and Marxism. Before I do that, what, what led you uh, uh, to Marxism as a, as a system of analysis that you could uh, build on and, and add to and so on? Well, it's a sort of... Uh a bit of a joke that uh, some Europeans like to tell about uh, Europeans who translate to the United States. And I moved to the United States in 1969. Mm. And I think the U.S. has two effects on you. It either turns you really radical mm -hmm. <laughs> because you get shocked by the kinds of situations you, in you encounter or you sort of throw your lot in with the system and you become kind of pretty right wing. And mm -hmm. I guess you've interviewed people We've done both yes, trajectories. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, right. So I, I, I took the left wing traje trajectory. I came to the United States. I was went to Baltimore. I was in the midst, in the in the wake of the uh, the '68 uh, uprisings, riots, whatever you want to call them, and uh, around the death of Martin Luther King. And uh, I was shocked at the conditions I found there. I was really, really shocked that here's the wealthiest country in the world, where people live in this chronic impoverishment, and I was really upset. So I started to participate much more in the sort of uh, political activism around that. And then, of course, the anti-war movement was in full swing, so I participated in that. And I think at that time I felt that somehow or other the theoretical framework I'd been using for my own work wasn't adequate to that political situation. So I thought, well, we should read Marx, you know, just for interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of us sat down and read Marx, and I started to find it a very compelling framework within which uh, I could sort of formulate problems, think through things uh, in terms of uh, my intellectual work, but it was also increasingly helpful politically. Mm -hmm. and, and was there a nice uh, fit uh, between geography and Marxism, uh, or was, was that something you had to build? That's something I had to build, and I think it's uh, still the case that uh, a lot of Marxists don't take geographical differentiation and all the issues that I'm concerned with uh, seriously at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started to work with Marxism, there was very little concern about urbanization, very little concern about environmental issues, uh, which, both of which were crucial to the sort of, you know, the, the topics I was interested in. Mm -hmm. So in some ways it was a bit of a battle to get Marxists to take the sort of geographical angle seriously. And uh, again, one of the quips I like to make, it was easier to bring Marxism into geography than it has been to take the geography back into Marxism. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't an easy fit. And uh, it led me to kind of reformulate and reconfigure some of the basic arguments that Marx makes in a, in a much more sort of down-to-earth way. I mean, that was my, my, my agenda, was to take the rather ab grand abstractions of that theory and make it work in a in sort of geographically differentiated world. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you mentioned that you had come back, you had, you had seen the American cities uh, uh, burning, you, you then began to, to look at a, a new body of theory that, mm -hmm. that hadn't influenced you in the past. Uh, some of your early, some of your work has been on cities. Right. Could you give us an example of how this, this all sort of comes together in a, in a way of seeing things 
interesting say about cities. You, uh, uh, you say at uh, some point in an interview, which I found on the web, uh, that you become aware of problems and then you fight them out finding different ways to, to frame the issue. I put together two quotes there. I, uh, when I first got to Baltimore, there were, there were a lot of sort of studies going on on, on, on cities, and I became very involved in uh, uh, the problem of housing, and uh, housing finance, uh, housing collapse in the inner city, uh, housing conditions in general. So I was uh, fascinated to do a series of reports for uh, the city and also for other other agencies about you know how to approach the whole kind of question of, of uh, urban regeneration which was very much on the on the agenda there and it was extraordinary to me that uh, some of the ideas I got for that came out of reading Engels hmm. famous thing on the condition of the working class in England in 1844 and also on the housing question where he says you know the bourgeoisie only has one way to solve its housing problem it moves it around mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and actually when you start to look at what you know, some, uh, some of the proposals were, they were about gentrification, which in mm -hmm. effect would displace people and just simply move the problem around. So I made a big pitch in, this, in, these, in these reports about saying, well, if, you, if you're going to address this question, you can't address it in a way that simply moves it around. Mm -hmm. And in order not to move it around, we have to deal with some basic questions about income distribution, uh, wealth, and, 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 and the like, and also, of course, racism in housing markets and so on. So this, to me, was a very, was a very important kind of principle that came out of you know, reading Engels, in this case, and, and then importing it. And I put it into these reports. I didn't cite Engels. Yeah, that's what I was just going to ask I, I, didn't, I didn't cite Engels. Uh, and everybody thought this was a fantastic insight, you see. And somebody said to me at some point, where did you get that from? And I said, from Engels. And they kind of said, who is he? See, so, Tom Engels, <laughs> yes, the, Tom local, Engels. the local congressman. Does he work for the Brookings Institution or something like that? See, so it was kind of really funny. But, but no, this was the kind of way in which I would, I would sometimes find myself using this stuff uh, in a very insightful ways and when you did it resonated with people and I think I got a lot of my encouragement to keep, keep with this kind of framework that when you actually laid out issues in this kind of way using these kinds of concepts people understood what you meant the only mm -hmm. time they turned around and walked the other way is when you told them where it came from mm -hmm. and, and in what ways was was Marxism not adequate and and was it informed by what you knew as a geographer uh, I didn't find it adequate to, on, on things like, uh, um, say, uh, the environmental issue. Mm -hmm. So I thought there was a lot of work to be done to sort of bring that up to, to pace. Um, it hadn't been very strong on, on urbanization in general. I mean, Engels had these two kind of, kind of things that were very useful. Marx himself didn't say that much about urbanization, a little bit. And I thought we had a big job to do to talk about the massive transformation taking place in the, uh, around the world in terms of the urbanization of the Earth's surface. I mean, it's not just simply you know, what was going on in Baltimore, but you've got things like you know, Sao Paulo growing immensely, Mexico City growing immensely. And I felt there was a worldwide transformation of going on. I mean, uh, more and more people were living in massive urban centers, mm -hmm. sometimes 20 million people, this kind of thing. And Marxism wasn't really paying much attention to it because it was mainly focused on what was going on in the point of production what was going on in the factory. That was mm -hmm. the center of what Marxian theory was about. And I was saying, what's going on in the factory is very important. What's going on in the city is also equally important. And of course, there were other people who were thinking that too. Manuel Castells, for example. And uh, so there were several of us who, who, were, who were trying to push that uh, line of argument within Marxism. But we didn't have a major audience within, you know, within the Marxist fold in, in general until much later. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I read somewhere that you got interested in environmentalism uh, because of some of the work that your students were doing. Is that, has there been an interaction as you've gone along where, in a way, you're, you're learning from your students or they're pointing you in the direction of new ideas that they're playing with? I always uh, learn from my students. The, there's, a, there's a great line Marx has, which is, who is going to educate the educators? Mm -hmm. And my students have always been one of my primary sources of education. Mm -hmm. And uh, they force me to look at problems in a different kind of way. They take up issues which uh, I'm sometimes reluctant to take up, and they have to hit me over the head and drag me into these, and I, and I eventually get into them. Uh, on the environmental issue, it wasn't... Uh, 
so much that it was uh, um, it was the, the you know the Earth Day movement. It was more the sort of political movement that was going on uh, around uh, at that time, which was uh, which was influencing me. But in in many other regards, uh, yes, indeed, my my students have always been a primary source of education. Not only graduate students, also undergraduates can sometimes mm. pose you with uh, compelling questions, which at some point or other you feel you have to address. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little about activism and uh, uh, your involvement in activism, how that has impacted your research, or it's just be being made aware of the activism as you just cited with, with Earth Day. It's, uh, it's a, a mixed thing. I mean, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an activist. I'm not an organizer. I'm, I'm not uh, good at those things. That's not where my strengths lie. But I frequently try to work with movements uh, and to try to provide them with some sort of support, both in terms of analysis of situations, uh, data on situations, sometimes logistical support, sometimes financial support. So I've always tried to act in a supportive role to, to what was going on out there. I've never been good at making things happen out there, mm -hmm. but when things are happening out there, I've always tried to move into a supportive, uh, supportive role. And moving into a supportive role means that I sometimes do get involved in, well, you know, you get involved on demonstrations and you get involved in mm -hmm. things like uh, the rent control movement in, in Baltimore in the, in the 1970s, the living wage movement in Baltimore in the 1990s. So you, you do get involved um, in, in, you know, sort of as part of an organization, and I, but I've never taken a leading role. And in some ways, I think it's good that uh, academics uh, like myself don't take leading roles in those things that should be done by others. But we can certainly offer a lot in the way of support. W one of the issues that, that arises in, in uh, uh, activist uh, circles, I think, is the problem that you touched on in, in the beginning of our discussion, which is this uh, uh, the the tension, the the uh, the synergy, uh, uh, the, the sometimes the conflict between the local and uh, uh, the the cosmopolitan or international and so on. Uh, I, I would guess as a, 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 your your work as a geographer has has really sensitized you to that dynamic. Uh, you, you mentioned that your first study was about uh, a particular place and a particular industry, but, but it must have been embedded in the global even though it was local. Yeah, I think this, this, is, I mean, this is a perpetual problem. It never, it never goes away. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if you can say, ah, there's a solution to it. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right to use the term, you know, that we should be sensitized to it mm -hmm. and, and sensitive to it. Uh, because there is always this issue if you're looking at uh, questions of Baltimore politics, for example, or uh, politics in Oxford. What's the relationship between the political agenda which is going on in this particular place at this particular time and some of the global forces that are at work and some of the global issues which are being, which are being put on the, the, the agenda? So again, those are the kinds of things that it seems to me somebody like myself can draw some attention to in relationship to local action. At the same time, I'm almost always asking myself in the midst of local action, what is the universal significance of this? Will this, mm -hmm. how will this change the world in general? And there are situations where a local movement, and I think of, for example, the living wage movement, which originated in Baltimore, uh, then became much more widespread across the country. So here's a local initiative that some, somehow or other has a national residence and even, even an international residence. And uh, so this seems to me to be part of uh, the way in which politics gets done. It's what I call a politics of militant particularism. You start with a militant idea in a particular place and then it gets translated into, into a much more sort of global uh, political, political movement. And we see that with things like living wage movements, anti-sweatshop movements, you know, and, and, and the environmental movement has, I think, uh, been very much full of that sort of activity where it's a local issue which then suddenly becomes much more global in its uh, scope. And, and what, is, what is the key element in seeing and making that link? I mean, obviously, with somebody with your background, you, you, you come uh, to a, 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 a local activism and see it right away. But what about the activists themselves? How, how do, what is that process like of, of making those linkages? It's, it's hard. I mean, sometimes, I mean, this is one of the arguments I often have with local, local activists, is not to say, look, what you're doing is wrong. It's to say, look, you should mm -hmm. actually try to contextualize what you're doing in relationship to a, these, these, these other issues. And a lot of the time, however, they say, we can't do that. We're so concentrated on 
doing what we're doing here that we really don't have time or space to think about that. And I think that's a pity. Uh, and I have had, you know, lots of you know, arguments about that with mm. at the local uh, at the local level, and it's 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 never easy. And there is, of course, a tendency right now uh, within, for example, the alternative globalization movement uh, to say well, all the solutions lie at the local level. We don't have to have a global kind of uh, trajectory in what we're doing. We just simply have to sort of say, do this at the local level, and then this is this is where the solution lies. And I think again, that's a for me, that's a, a, a false hope. Uh, and uh, but nevertheless, I can I can see it as part of the politics right now. So it's something that. I can only, all I can do is sort of debate it and discuss it and say, look, this is a problem. I think that we should be thinking about this in a rather different way. Before we talk about your new book, I, 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 I'm intrigued by the, the fact that you went back to, you went to Oxford as the Mackinder professor. Yeah. Uh, Mackinder was the great uh, geographer of empire. Geography yeah. was, in the beginning, uh, the, the, the handmaiden of empire. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, uh, just listening to your intellectual odyssey, it, it's clear that geography over time can become something else, really, in terms of, of where it stands on Politically. Well, it can be it can be a, a vital tool of anti-imperialist politics, yeah, for example, yeah. and it can it can you know. Uh, but also, we have to look very closely at the nature of geographical relations, and so one of the things I did draw from Mackinder uh, is uh, well, if you want, if you do have a political project of some kind, and his was very conservative and very imperial, nevertheless, you need to know what's there. And you need to have a good understanding of what's there, uh, both in terms of population dynamics and cultural forms and physical kind of environments and possibilities. So you have, a, you have to have a good idea of what's there in order to work through what your politics is about. I mean, it's hopeless for me uh, to go into, say, Nicaragua and, and start to talk as if uh, this is Sweden mm -hmm. and that they should have a politics like Sweden. I, you know, this is not, this doesn't make sense. So what, what, what I'm, I would say is, well, if we are going to have an alternative globalization movement uh, to the sort of capitalistic, imperialistic forms, then we have to also pay great attention to what is there. Mm -hmm. And so the, the geographical knowledge then becomes a significant part of uh, how political programs are formulated, but it's also a significant part of political power. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, your new book is The New Imperialism. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it seems to uh, uh, follow logically from your, your career. I'm sure this is a problem that you thought about over time, although I guess this is the, your first book on the topic. And it obviously relates to what's uh, going on in, in, in the world today. So, so what is, your book is called The, uh, uh, the uh, New Imperialism. And uh, w what is new about the new imperialism? Well, that's one of the questions mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, I wanted to address. I want to ask that question. I'm not sure I found uh, the complete solution to it. I think I identified some things. But one of, the, one of the things I would point out here is that for a long time I've been actually been talking about the spatial or geographical dynamics of capital accumulation and what I call uneven geographical development. How uh, these molecular processes of capital flow moving from one part of the country to another build spaces, new spaces of, of and geographical concentrations, even within countries, so that when you look at the United States, you say, well, 50 years ago it was the Northeast and the Midwest where the center of everything was, and then something happened, the capillary flow all went to the South and the West, and there's a changing dynamics of political power that come, come out of that. So I've always been interested in these geographical processes whereby capital capital is creating landscapes, sometimes knocking down landscapes uh, and building new landscapes. And so I've always been interested in that. And this, of course, does lead in many instances to certain issues of domination. Uh, uh, in the 19th century, you know, it was Boston capital that dominated a lot of things, New York capital and then the Chicago capital. So internally, there's often relations of domination. So when it came to thinking about, you know, imperialism in general, I wanted to locate the notion of imperialism against the background of those kinds of processes of, of, of production of space by, by, by capital accumulation. So that's what I wanted to do. To do. 
explain to us for uh, a wider audience what you mean by capitalist accumulation. Uh, uh, give us a, a, a way of understanding that. Well, capital, capitalist has money, uh, mm -hmm. puts it into circulation and comes out with more money at the end. Mm -hmm. And that more money is an accumulation of capital. And then the question arises, what do they do with that more money that comes out at the end? In many instances, they plow it back in mm -hmm. to make even more money. So there is a kind of logistical process of, of capital accumulation. And sometimes they make money by other means, by takeovers and you know, all, all, sorts of, all sorts of strategies for making more money. So, so the dynamic of our society, uh, capitalist society, is really powered by the push always to accumulate capital, to make a profit. And profit means the system has to expand because there has to be more at the end of the year than there was at the beginning. So we end up with the notion that, for example, growth is a, is a significant indicator of the health of the system. Uh, a capitalist system must grow or bust. And it is that growth which is, which I am talking about as capital accumulation. It's the growth of capital. Mm -hmm. you, you, you say that uh, in your book that it's important uh, to distinguish between territorial and capitalist logic of power. And in a way, that's what you've just talked about, yes. really. The, the interface, uh, the synthesis, the interaction uh, between a, a logic that uh, expands the space mm -hmm. on the one hand, and the other, the the uh, the need of capitalism uh, to find new new places uh, to make profit and so right. on. This 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 operates. I mean, one of the ways I've looked at it is to look at this not simply at the nation state level. Look at it at the area of uh, say uh, a mayor of a city like Baltimore. Um, Deindustrialization is going on. Capital is moving out. So what does the mayor do in charge of this territory? Mm -hmm. Kind of say, oh, okay, that's okay. Or do they say, we have to find new ways to bring new capital in? Mm -hmm. so, so, so the territorial logic is about trying to maintain the health and well-being of a particular space in the face of this capillary movement of capital moving left, right, and center and everywhere. And if uh, the steel industry is collapsing and the shipbuilding is collapsing, then what, do, what does the, somebody who's in charge of the territorial logic do? And then you see, well, they say, oh, maybe it's convention centers and the convention business, and maybe it's uh, museums, maybe it's tourism or something of that kind. So, mm -hmm. so the territorial logic is very much about trying to maintain the, the health and well-being of a particular place and space within, within this, this, this motion, which is very hard for anybody to control because, you know, capitalists decide they're going to take their money from here and put it there. You can't really stop them unless you've got sort of strong regulatory controls, which by and large have disappeared, of course. You, you have another concept which I want you to explain to us, uh, which is uh, central to your argument, and it's, uh, it's uh, the distinction between accumulation by expanded reproduction and that uh, by primitive accumulation. And, and you call primitive accumulation accumulation by dispossession. Yes. I'm, uh, help us understand those terms. Accumulation by dispossession is really about uh, dispossessing somebody of their assets or their rights. Uh, and there have traditionally been some rights which have been sort of uh, common property. And so one of the ways in which you take these away is, is by privatizing them. So we've seen moves in the recent years to privatize water, and traditionally everybody was, had access to water, then it gets privatized, and then you have to pay for it. Uh, we've seen the privatization of a lot of education going on by the defunding of the, the public sector, and so more and more people have to turn to the private sector. We've seen the same thing in health care. So, so what, what, what it seems to me is that what we're talking about here is the taking away of universal rights uh, and the privatization of them so it's your particular responsibility rather than the responsibility of uh, the state. And one of the proposals which we now have is of course the privatization of social security. Social security may not be that generous, but it's universal and everybody <laughs> has, mm. has part of it. And what we went now saying is, well, that shouldn't be, it should be privatized which of course means that people will then have to invest in their own pension funds, which means more money goes to Wall Street. And, you know, mm -hmm. <coughs> so this is what I call privatization by dispossession in, in our particular circumstance. But then a lot of other things are going on. For instance, 
uh, when you start to look at the way in which people's lands have been taken away, peasant movements are being sort of destroyed by, by state action. So there's a lot of things of that sort which are, which are happening around the world where people are accumulating at other people's expense. Mm -hmm. And a good example of this would be uh, the oil companies in places like Nigeria, for example, where uh, the company comes in and, and displaces land mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, mm -hmm. creates all sorts of uh, 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 conditions that, right. that really destroy a way of life. Yes, no, that's, 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 that's right. I think the other thing is, look at the way in which U.S. subsidized agriculture is destroying rural life in Mexico since the Mexicans took away all of the protections of collective ownership uh, in peasant societies and privatized the land. So here you have, again, another situation where a way of life is destroyed. Uh, by a particular kind of economic and political process. When, when we're talking about empire or imperialism, we're talking about the United States. Mm -hmm. And and what what is the 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 particular evolution of capitalism in the United States that that we should understand to understand uh, the pro processes at work as, as we, 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 we have, the, our global role has taken a new form. You spoke yesterday in your lecture of, of the financialization of American capitalism. Talk a little about that. I think the switch into sort of uh, financial domination of the world, which occurred in the sort of 1970s, uh, was a specific move which was taken within the United States to enhance finance capitalism against manufacturing and productive capitalism. So manufacturing and productive capitalism has largely been pushed out of the United States. Mm. I mean, not, not entirely, obviously, but much of it has moved to East and Southeast Asia, and uh, of course quite a bit is in Europe as well, so that the United States is no longer a dominant player in the world of production. Uh, but it took the view that, well, that didn't matter, provided it always had the financial power. And it used the financial power to its advantage during the 1980s and 1990s in particular and assembled a great deal of wealth here out of this particular financial financialization strategy. What we now see is that's coming to an end. I mean, the internal budget deficit of the United States, the current account deficit of the United States is making the U.S. into a chronic debtor country. And if you're a debtor country, you're vulnerable to those who hold your debt. And this is, a, I think, a real threat. Uh, to American hegemony, Amer American domination. Mm -hmm. and, and how then, uh, in, in this situation of vulnerability, do we account for, uh, uh, or, or uh, do we account for the new emphasis on territoriality? Because, it, because the, in a way, the neoconservatives are really uh, leading the show right now, or appearing to lead the show, uh, based, uh, it, driven in a way by what you would call the territorial logic. Mm -hmm. Now, as leaders of the state, in a, th they are in a different situation than the mayor of Baltimore, who you were yes. just talking yes. about. W what are those differences, and why their newfound importance? Is it, is it a measure of America's weakness that you've just talked about? Uh, this is a, the big mystery the question, in a way, uh, and I think we can only make informed guesses about it. My, my informed guess is, that first off, that this switch uh, in the way in which uh, the U.S. is approaching the world into a much more territorial kind of vision by, the, in effect, the occupation of, of Iraq, uh, this is a great departure in U.S. Uh, political uh, political history. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a new kind of imperialist practice which uh, the U.S. has not really followed uh, for a hundred years or, or so. It takes us back to the McKinley period and what happened at the end of the 19th century. Um, so there's a big issue as to why, why, you know, why that switch into, into a territorial thing and then also why this switch into militarization. And, and here too it seems to me we have a uh, not exactly an entirely new thing, because U.S. military power has always been a significant a aspect of U.S. imperialist practices, but to, to make it explicit in this kind of way. And this is rather different from what could be seen as a defensive war in Vietnam to this is an offensive, preemptive kind of war to try to establish a territorial kind of configuration which is new in global politics. So I think this is, this is something which is, which, is, which is distinctively new. My feeling about it is, that the neoconservative vision which is driving this is very, very much concerned about maintaining authority and maintaining order. 
and it hasn't got the leverage it once had through financial mechanisms or through productive mm -hmm. capacity or even through cultural persuasion that it once had. The only leverage it's got left is indeed mm -hmm. the military one and the military one of course is not very good at fighting diffuse forces. It's, the military one is or has always been about territorial logic so the turn to militarization brings you back into the territorial, uh, territorial aggrandizement kind of, kind of move. I don't think this is consistent with US American uh, imperialist practices and I'm not sure it's going to last. It may in fact be something that just sort of they, they try and then, then it's going to be found wanting and I think in some ways the Iraq venture is already uh, a failure. And if that is the case, then we're going to have to find some sort of reconfiguration of U.S. imperialist practices back to uh, probably the sorts of things that were going on in the 1980s and 1990s, if, if they can possibly do it. But again, the problem right now is the weakness of the United States in terms of its financial situation and also in terms of its productive capacity situation. You, you make, uh, the, uh, you emphasize also the, the importance of the dynamic between the inner logic and the external logic. Right. That, that, that also relates to what you're saying here. I think the internal situation in the United States has a very important role to play in, in how you know, things happen on the outside and, and conversely what happens on the outside feeds back into the United States. I'm very, very concerned right now about you know, this famous statement that Hannah Arendt made which, which is that empire abroad means tyranny at home. Uh, and I think we're seeing the militarization of action abroad, but I think we're also seeing an attempt to militarize U.S. society at home. I thought that uh, it was a wonderful moment when Bush uh, was introducing the Attorney General uh, Ashcroft, and he said, uh, he's a general. I wonder why we call him a general. Well, I guess it's because we're all in the military now. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of attitude to say, you know, to militarization of U.S. political life is a very scary kind of aspect. And of course, the war on terror and the fear of terror becomes part of the ways in which you justify that militarization both abroad and, and, and at home. So I'm, I'm rather nervous about how that fear is being used for a particular kind of political end to try to establish order and authority both at home and abroad. I, I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are about uh, the role of technology in all of this because as you pointed out uh, we've, the, the country has failed uh, in, uh, in, in some ways in integrating technology into production that's actually located here. But in, in terms of integrating technology into uh, the military, yes. it, it provides a vehicle to, to be a global policeman uh, in, in, in a new effective right. way in military terms, not necessarily in political terms. Comment on that if, if, you, if you see that connection two, as somebody who looks at these kinds two of things. Two things. One area in which I think the U.S. still does have a lot of dominance is in terms of technological innovation. And of course a lot of that does connect to the military aspect of things. Uh, about 50% of the world's R&D is done inside the United States. So the United States is still a center of, of, of technological innovation. The big problem is it doesn't use that technological innovation uh, internally. A lot of it goes abroad. Uh, the Japanese and the Chinese and the you know, Singa people in Singapore are very adept at taking U.S. technologies, paying royalties for it, uh, but then using them for their own, own specific uh, production systems so that that technological advantage uh, doesn't necessarily remain within the United States except that there's a flow of rents into the United States paying you know, for licenses and fees and so on. On the military side, I think we see a real problem here. I mean, what we see is that technologically the U.S. can dominate almost anything now from 30,000 feet up. But if you are into occupying a place like Iraq on the ground, you know, dominating the world from 30,000 feet up with high technology is it's just not going to work. And, and, and you need massive ground forces. And we see already, you know, the United States is running out of forces to keep on the ground. It's trying to construct, a, in effect, a mercenary force by in effect paying for the Polish troops to be there, paying for you know, 20 people to be there from Lithuania or Estonia or wherever, and it's trying to cons construct almost a mercenary army because it doesn't have, uh, as it were, the, the, the military power on the ground for this. And I think what we're seeing is the, uh, an overstretching of military manpower right now, which is kind of a real crucial problem, which can't be resolved by this tremendous emphasis upon technological advantage. Mm -hmm. you, you've uh, you've discussed the the 
the, uh, or hinted at the limits to um, the new imperialism in the United States, uh, an anti-colonial tradition on the one hand, uh, a real kind of uh, sorry state of American capitalism right. as it moves to financialization. Uh, I would like to ask you about the oppositional element uh, in, in the sense that uh, as a Marxist, uh, you probably are sensitive to the oppositional forces arising in, in a particular place and so on by, as a result of the disenfranchises from the, the, the processes afoot. What, what, what do you see as the basis for uh, a politics grounded in, in true opposition to American imperialism? There are uh, several ways in which you can co configure the opposition, um, and these aren't necessarily the ones that I, I would favor. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of nationalist opposition around the world to U.S. global domination. Uh, and some of that is beginning to provoke certain alliances amongst forces which are very resistant to what the U.S. is up to around the world. You can see this uh, increasingly with things like uh, the alliance which is emerging between, say, Brazil and India and China mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Russia, which is becoming quite nationalist as well. So what, what we're seeing is a, is a, is a zone of resistance uh, to, to, to what the U.S. is trying to do globally which I don't think is progressive at all. I think in many ways it's regressive and I think it's dangerous, but nevertheless it is a, it is a very strong um, uh, force of opposition. I mean, an, an alliance between, say, Russia, China, India, and Brazil against the United States or against Europe seems to me to be quite a sort of fierce a global kind of uh, battle, mm -hmm. which I would not like to see unfold, but I think it's, it's, it's there. Then there are uh, many other forms of, uh, of, of opposition. Uh, at a much more local level. Um, there is one kind of wing of uh, the anti-globalization, alternative globalization, which I've already mentioned, which is, says all the solutions lie at the local level. And uh, they are kind of trying to construct their own local solutions. In some cases, this can be very, I think, uh, very helpful in the sense that a local solution can spill out and become general uh, if, if people find a way to make something work in a particular place, in a particular way. So there's a lot of experimentation at that, at that uh, kind of level. What worries me right now is there's not a very coherent uh, kind of general opposition uh, with a very uh, good plan against what, what's happening uh, with uh, both globally and, more, and locally. For example, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed that there is a great deal of discontent in this country over things like education, health care, mm -hmm. public services, failing infrastructures, and yet there's no political movement which is articulating those mm -hmm. ideas and kind of saying this has to be part of a new progressive politics in this country, and anybody who go, comes to power must address those issues. I mean, I see the Democrats beginning to address those issues, not because they want to, mm -hmm. but because the base is forcing them. But I'm very, but I don't think they're speaking to the, to the anger that exists amongst large groups in the population over what is happening to them in terms of their, of, of, of their life and, 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 and having to, you know, the healthcare problems and the insurance problems and the lack of, uh, the lack of resources, which, you know, in the midst of this tremendous wealth, mm -hmm. which is being accumulated by, you know, this pluto plutocracy, in a sense, of the upper classes. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what, what uh, explanations can you offer for that? Is it the failure of the media? Is it, is it uh, the, uh, some element in postmodernity where people aren't able to make the connections uh, uh, that are necessary to, to then move toward political action? I think it's all, all of the above. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I think it's a configuration of things that come together. I mean, I think the, the emphasis on, on special issues, on, uh, you know, for instance, uh, gay rights, uh, women's movement, uh, all those things, which I think are very important and I would support them. But if those are the only questions, then, mm -hmm. then, then immediately becomes hugely fragmentary. I mean, I would, it would be appalling, for example, if the next election was decided mainly on the issue of do you or do you not support gay marriage, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be, the, but, but nevertheless, you can see how those issues get used as, as part of the uh, political means to, to, to remain in power. So, so I'm very concerned about that. Then, of course, there is the media. 
the debasement of uh, public discourse is very distressing to me. I mean, you know, even in, in, in responsible media now, they won't handle difficult questions in a, in a kind of responsible way. And, and much of what's happened is the whole world has been reduced into sort of uh, O'Reilly shouting at Al Franken or an Al Franken shouting back at O'Reilly. And that seems to be absolutely no way in which we can really sit down and have a kind of sensible discussion about which way we should go and how we should go. But uh, as soon as you try to have a sensible discussion, it, it gets thrown into this maelstrom where it just turns into the shouting match of slagging off uh, each other. So that's, and, and the media is complicit in that a lot of the time because it's a spectacle. It's a reduction of public discourse to, to the spectacle of you know gladiatorial you know sort of uh, nonsense in, in 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 the studio so it's some of that but it, then it's also the fact that the, there's, there's there's been no institutional form and here is the failure of the party system in this country and the fact that both parties are so beholden to big capital for their money that neither of them are really going to sort of uh, take on a class is issue and, and, and say, yes, this is class war. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a class issue. And yes, we have to kind of confront this as a class mm -hmm. issue across race lines, across gender lines, across sexual orientation lines. This is a class issue. And we've got to get, as it were, a class politics back into the country somehow. But I don't, but you know, there's a lot of forces against that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like you to comment on the role of the Blair government and uh, your, your uh, country of origin yeah. uh, with regard uh, to the new imperialism because uh, uh, Blair's uh, labor government really uh, uh, became uh, 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 an instrument uh, uh, to further uh, U.S. goals. How do you account for that and, and what does it mean? It has a, long, has a long history. I think it goes back to Suez in 1956 uh, when the British went on their own and the US wrapped them over the knuckles and said, uh, get out of there, uh, get out of Egypt. Uh, and after that, the British tied themselves very much to US foreign policy and they've been very reluctant ever to go against US foreign policy. So there's been that long-standing tie. In addition, remember, uh, the British and the Americans were patrolling Iraq in the air jointly during the 1990s uh, and maintaining the, the uh, free fly zone. And, and so Britain was heavily involved in the Iraq thing all the way through the Clinton years. And when Bush came to power and took this, uh, the, the British had a difficult choice. You know, you see, it's one thing for France to say they won't join in an action. It would be very difficult for Britain to say we are not we're going to get out of an action. Mm -hmm. And I think the British knew also that Bush is a very vindictive politician and you desert him and you're, you're in trouble. And there are a lot of things that the US could have created where they could have created real trouble uh, for the British, particularly in Northern Ireland. Mm. Interestingly, I think mm. that, uh, that, and I think actually one of the reasons why Ajnar in Spain went in and joined in this whole thing had to do with getting ETA declared as a terrorist organization by the United States. So the United States was in a position to create trouble for those governments in some ways, mm. and Britain didn't want that. But in addition, I think that Blair, in his messianic way, really believes in a different kind of imperialist practice to the United States. And I found it fascinating when he gave the talk in Congress, came to Congress, gave this talk. He, he insisted that we not talk about American values, we talk about universal values. Mm. And we have to talk about them in a way which doesn't privilege. And so Blair, I think, has been trying to set up a rather different kind of, a more cosmopolitan kind of imperialism as opposed to the almost nationalist kind of imperialism that you're getting in the United States formulated by the Bush administration that says American values are supreme values. Everybody in the world wants to be an American. Everybody believes that we are the beacon of freedom and, and, and all of that. And Blair was saying, no, that's not the case. So I think that Blair had a view that somehow or other he could, he could pull Bush into a kind of different kind of imperialist practice which would be a little less nationalistic and more universal. And I think we saw this in the fact that Blair, I think, was the one who pushed Bush into e even setting up something like the road map uh, in, in the Middle East for the Palestinian-Israeli thing. I don't think the Bush administration would have done it on its own. Mm -hmm. I think it did it because um, you know, Britain was pushing them and, the, and they had to do something uh, along those lines. So I think the British situation in relationship to this I don't, uh, has to be understood in those, in those sorts of terms. And I guess also he sees Britain as a mediator with Europe 
in, in a way. Well, yes, he, 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 he maybe thinks that, but of course he's not been a very good mediator. <laughs> he's been more antagonistic <laughs> yeah. to Europe. But recently he's been trying to sort of win back a little bit of a position in, uh, in Europe because I think he realizes that he got isolated in, in, in the European context. Uh, one, uh, one final question. I'm, I'm curious how you would advise students to prepare uh, for the future and, and in this conversation it's been very interesting to see how you know geography uh, uh, and Marxism have come together in your work to think about issues and to frame them in different ways and so on. Now uh, clearly uh, 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 Marxist analysis you know with the end of the Cold War it has, it may have gotten something of an unfair rap with regard to the tools it can bring to analysis but, but comment on a little as a geographer and, and somebody who does Marxist analysis how, how should they think about their own future and prepare for it? I think uh, you know there are a number of scenarios you can you can set up uh, the world could dissolve very fast, and these things can happen very quickly, uh, can dissolve into uh, regional factions which are very antagonistic to each other. I've already mentioned uh, sort of China, Russia, India and Brazil sort of in some sort of alliance with other, other countries uh, against the United States and against Europe. You can also see East and Southeast Asia sort of building its own regional kind of configuration which could potentially be very much antagonistic to the United States and to Europe. So the world could dissolve into sort of almost warring regional factions unless you watch out. Mm -hmm. And one of the big issues is how do we, how do we devise a politics that's gonna, gonna sort of stop that? Uh, I also see the situation, if, if the US is no longer as dominant in the world as it once was, maybe people in this country should accept that. And accept that now they're just one player amongst many and ask themselves the question, in what way can we play a benevolent, beneficial role, uh, a healing role in this whole kind of global situation in relationship to global poverty, global environmental degradation? Ask ourselves how we can do that in a constructive kind of way, rather than simply saying, United States is number one and we're going to do everything to maintain it as number one and uh, capital is sacrosanct and cannot be touched. I think we have another issue. And I think one of the ways to think about this is precisely to think about the way uh, politics and geography should go together, that our, our strategy has to be mm. about thinking of the geographical issue, what is going on in India, what is going on in environmental degradation in Brazil, what is going on in, 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 in China, and then to sort of think about a, a, an alternative positionality of uh, the U.S. body politic in, 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 in global, uh, global relations. So this is the, the sort of thing that I would recommend that people think, and I, this doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be committed to a Marxist politics at all. What it says is, look, there are issues out there and they're not going to go away, and you better pay attention to them because uh, if you carry on as business as usual, well, I'm sorry, the business is not going to be as usual. It's going to be a very difficult next uh, 10 years, no matter what way you think of it. And the U.S., what the U.S. does is rather crucial because it can either engage in catastrophic actions or it, or it can engage in sort of constructive actions. And, uh, you know, there's a long history of thinking in Marxism about the notion of creative destruction, mm -hmm. that in order to, to create something, you have to destroy something. Well, the U.S. Uh, can be very good at destroying things. The big question is what is it going to create and how is it going to create it and, 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 and who is it going to create it with because it can't just simply create the world in its own image anymore. That is gone, I think. David, on that note uh, of, about the future and, and, the, and the way to avoid the pitfalls of the future that we might create ourselves unintentionally, thank you very much well, for, uh, for joining us today uh, and sharing with us this, this fascinating intellectual odyssey. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.